Hey, I'm Laren. This is Knife Still Nerds. Today we're talking about thermocycling, which is kind of a generic term used by knife makers, mostly to refer to all of the steps that we do after forging, but before the final osinatize and quench. Uh, so uh, normally we're referring to normalizing and annealing. Normalizing is a process where we heat up to a relatively high temperature and air cool. Annealing you can be done in several different ways, but one way is to heat up to non-magnetic and then slow cool. And that gives us a nice soft structure. So what we're trying to accomplish is to get a, a microstructure and hardness that is easy to machine and drill and cut with a bandsaw and also will heat treat well so that our final properties are good. So we have good hardness, good wear resistance, good toughness, etc. So those are the things that we're trying to accomplish with thermal cycling. Is thermocycling the secret to the ultimate in toughness and edge retention? How do you do it correctly and what happens in the microstructure of the steel? All this and more here on Knife Steel Nerds. As you heat up steel, its grains grow. So with the high temperatures used in forging, you generally have a very large grain size. A small grain size is more desirable because it means better toughness. While the grains can be viewed like this under a microscope after etching to reveal the boundaries, another common technique is used by fracturing the steel and observing the fracture. A very smooth fracture appearance is a result of a fine grain size, and a coarse appearance means a coarse grain size. Therefore, one thing we would like to do during our post-forging treatment is to reduce the grain size down to a reasonable level. Heating the steel back up to over the austenite transformation temperature means the formation of new austenite grains. And if we keep the temperature low, the grains will not have a chance to grow and therefore will be small after cooling to room temperature. However, grains are not the only thing we need to worry about. The structure of the steel's carbides, which are hard particles composed of iron and carbon, also greatly affect the steel's properties. One thing that can occur during forging is the formation of carbides along grain boundaries, which will lead to reduced toughness. Therefore, we need to dissolve all of those carbides and get an even distribution of carbide. The higher the carbon content of the steel, the higher the temperature that is required to dissolve all of the carbides. Therefore, even though we might like to use a very low temperature for our cycling to minimize grain size, we have other goals we must achieve first, namely dissolving all of that carbide. So the temperature where we dissolve all of the carbide is the main thing that dictates the temperature of our first type of thermal cycling, normalizing. And while carbon is the most important element for dictating the temperature we need to use, other elements like chromium can also increase the temperature required for dissolving carbides. My book, Knife Engineering, has a table of recommended normalizing temperatures for different low alloy steels. Just heat the steel up to the recommended temperature for 10 to 15 minutes and then air cool. The temperature doesn't need to be super precise. 1600 degrees works for most steels under 1% carbon. During air cooling, the steel will transform from the high temperature phase austenite back to the low temperature phase of ferrite. Ferrite can accommodate almost no carbon, so the carbon will come out of solution and form carbides again. The steel will form both carbide and ferrite at the same time, which makes a structure called perlite. First, carbides precipitate at the grain boundaries. This removes carbon from the surrounding austenite so that ferrite can form. Then the carbide and ferrite will grow away from the grain boundary to form perlite. With a bit broader view, you can see perlite nucleating at multiple locations on grain boundaries and growing into the austenite until it is completely replaced with perlite. This gives us an even distribution of carbide going into our next steps of processing. Several different factors control the appearance and properties of perlite. One is cooling rate. On the left is 1080 steel that was cooled in air, and on the right is the same steel cooled in a furnace. You can see that the perlite is coarser with furnace cooling. Cooling more slowly also leads to lower hardness. Here is a chart comparing the hardness of 1095 with different cooling rates. If you are cooling a knife or a bar of steel in air, you won't have direct control over the cooling rate. However, thicker or thinner pieces of steel will have different cooling rates and therefore have different hardness. If you were cutting or drilling steel after normalizing, this will affect how easy or difficult that is to do. Different steels will also respond differently to normalizing. A steel with high hardenability will have higher hardness after normalizing. You can watch my last video on oil quenching to learn about hardenability. So on this chart you can see that this particular O1 I tested was relatively high in hardness at 40 Rockwell C, while 1084 with its low hardenability was only about 25 RC. If the steel I tested had been 16th inch instead, it would have been higher in hardness and lower in hardness if using thicker stock. Perlite can be relatively soft, but it does not machine as well as round carbides. Therefore, from the manufacturer, steel almost always comes in the spheroidized annealed condition. This is the softest and most machinable condition steel can be in. If we heat normalized perlitic steel to a temperature just below the austenite transformation, also called the critical temperature, the steel will spontaneously spheroidize the perlite. 
However, perlite is a, already a relatively stable structure, so this process can take many, many hours. This is called a subcritical anneal, and I don't generally recommend annealing in this way. A modified version of the subcritical anneal involves heating the steel to austenite and quenching first. This leads to hard martensite. However, if we temper the steel just below critical, we can get very soft steel. This is similar to any other tempering process, just we do it at such a high temperature that it becomes an annealing process for a soft machinable structure. Carbides precipitate out of the carbon-saturated martensite and coarsen with increasing temperature. At high enough temperature, we have ferrite and spheridized carbides. But my favorite type of annealing is a transformation anneal, also called a divorced eutectoid anneal, which has the coolest sounding name out of any of the annealing types. We heat the steel to austenite just above critical, but not so high that we dissolve all of the carbide. We leave some carbides because during cooling we are going to feed carbon to them and coarsen them. If there is enough carbide present, it is more favorable for the steel to grow the existing carbides rather than forming perlite. So as the ferrite grows into the steel, carbon diffuses along the boundary to the nearest carbides and grows them. This results in a structure of ferrite and spheridized carbide. How coarse those carbides are depends on how long we hold at the high temperature and how slowly we cool the steel. Data sheets of steels generally have very slow recommended cooling rates such as 50 degrees per hour. This results in a relatively coarse structure. However, we can use significantly faster cooling rates with most low alloy steels, such as 600 degrees per hour. This results in a finer structure at the cost of being slightly higher in hardness. The finer structure can lead to better toughness and better response to heat treatment. Instead of using a furnace to cool the steel slowly, you can also use a slow cool media like vermiculite. This is ideal for annealing from a forge. Just heat the steel to non-magnetic and no higher, and then place it in vermiculite for slow cooling. Here are micrographs comparing 52100 as it came from the manufacturer, and then 52100 that I normalized and then gave the rapid DET anneal by heating to non-magnetic and placing in vermiculite. The structure is significantly finer than what came from the steel company. This doesn't mean that the steel as it comes from the manufacturer is bad, but we can give up some machine ability for improvements in other areas. I mentioned heating a non-magnetic in relation to annealing, so we should take a quick detour about checking steel with a magnet when heat treating. With the high carbon steels typically used in knife making, the steel becomes non-magnetic when it transforms to austenite. The normal room temperature phase of steel is ferrite or martensite, which are both magnetic. However, the high temperature phase austenite is non-magnetic. There are even steels which are designed to be austenitic at room temperature, so they are non-magnetic even without heating them up. The fact that the steel becomes non-magnetic when it transforms to austenite is useful for our heat treating in a forge without temperature control. When doing the DET anneal, we want to transform the steel to austenite without dissolving too much carbide. This point is right where it becomes non-magnetic, because if we heat any more, we will start to dissolve more carbide, which is not what we want to do for the DET anneal. This is also the temperature where the grain size is the finest, so it is good for our goal of grain refinement. The same temperature of right at non-magnetic is good for a temper anneal prior to the quench as well. However, the difficulty with using a magnet comes with the final heating step, austenitizing before the quench. The general recommendation is to heat somewhat over non-magnetic to get the right amount of carbide to dissolve just before quenching. This becomes very tricky because it is easy to overshoot and get too much carbon in solution or to grow the grain. Here is an example of toughness testing with 5160 steel where we got very high toughness when austenitizing at 1525 or below, but then the toughness drops rapidly even with only at 1550 or 1575 degrees. Another issue with forge heat treating is that doing a hold time at a specific temperature is challenging. So ideally we would like the steel to dissolve carbide as rapidly as possible at the peak temperature. The steel as received from the manufacturer has relatively coarse carbides that do not easily dissolve without a soak. If we have a finer carbide structure such as with perlite, then the carbon does not have to diffuse as far, and the carbide is less stable so it dissolves more readily. So I did an experiment with 1084 and 52100 to see if we could get a structure fine enough that the steel will fully harden from right at non-magnetic. 52100 is the toughest case for this. 1084 is a simple carbon steel, so primarily just has carbon and iron, along with some manganese and silicon. But 52100 has 1.5% chromium, which means it generally requires high temperature and more soak time. Carbon diffuses very rapidly because it is small enough to fit between iron atoms. So even with a coarse spheridized structure, the carbides will dissolve relatively rapidly in a simple carbon steel like 1084. However, 52100 has a significant chromium addition. Chromium is a larger atom, and therefore the iron atoms have to slowly move out of the way for it to diffuse. Chromium is preferentially found in the carbides, and so to dissolve them, you need to move around chromium. So if we can get 52100 to austenitize rapidly, then we could do it with virtually any low alloy knife steel.
First, I heated both steels to 2100 degrees for an hour and air cooled to simulate the grain growth from forging. Then I normalized the 1084 at 1550 and the 5200 at 1700 and air cooled for perlite. I cut off pieces of those and also performed a DET anneal. Then with the different conditions, I heated the steel to nod magnetic and then quenched in parks 50. As expected, the 1084 didn't look that different whether it was annealed by the manufacturer, given a DET anneal by me, or in the normalized condition with perlite. It was becoming non-magnetic around 1385 degrees Fahrenheit. However, with 52100, we saw big differences in hardness. From perlite, the steel reached basically maximum hardness after quenching from 1445, which is about where it became non-magnetic. When heat treating from the manufacturer, the steel didn't become non-magnetic until a somewhat higher temperature of 1465, but it still only made it to just over 60 Rockwell as quenched. With a DET anneal, it got to about 62 and a half Rockwell. So perlite was a much better structure for achieving full hardness without a soak. Previously, we compared the toughness of 52100 after austenitizing from the DET anneal as opposed to the manufacturer condition. The 52100 heat treated from the fast DET led to higher hardness and better toughness than when heat treating from the manufacturer condition. This results from the finer carbide structure from our faster anneal than is performed by the steel company. However, the hardness of the as-received material was lower than I would expect. It should be more like 59 to 60 Rockwell. So I'm not exactly sure what happened. Maybe this 52100 was particularly coarse from the manufacturer. In another set of experiments, we annealed Crewforge V in different ways after forging and normalizing. We had a subcritical anneal, a temper anneal, and a DET anneal. I'm not sure if this subcritical anneal was long enough to do much spheroidizing, so it was probably mostly perlite. I also tested a specimen that was heat treated from the manufacturer condition. As expected, the hardness after heat treating from the manufacturer condition was the lowest. The temper anneal and subcritical anneal resulted in similar hardness and the DET anneal was in between. When plotting out the toughness versus hardness for the different conditions, there was little difference in toughness after compensating for hardness. So even though the temper anneal and subcritical anneal resulted in higher hardness, the hardness-toughness balance was not affected. This is the reason why I generally prefer the fast DET anneal when austenitizing in a furnace because you have more control over the final hardness. With a perlite structure, your only choice is very high hardness. With a fast DET anneal, you have greater control over hardness and how much carbide is left. The fast DET anneal also results in relatively similar response to heat treatment as is shown in data sheets, but with one to two points higher Rockwell. So it makes data sheets more useful. The finer microstructure provided by these alternate annealing procedures does affect the optimal austenitizing temperature, however. The data sheet recommends austenitizing between 1500 and 1550 when starting with the as-received coarse spheroidized structure. With the fast DET anneal, using 1450 resulted in similar hardness to 1500 with the as-received steel. And using 1550 resulted in extremely low toughness, presumably due to too much carbon in solution. So the fast DET anneal means that the optimal austenitizing temperature was reduced by about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The entire process has to work together. Many knife makers recommend grain refinement cycles in between the normalize and the anneal. This is not a crazy idea, as heating to austenite and cooling multiple times has been shown to reduce the grain size. These micrographs show a 1060 steel first overheated at 2000 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour and then heated to 1490 and air cooled multiple times. With more cycles, they got a finer grain size. However, as I described earlier, an anneal also was a cycle from a very low austenitizing temperature for a fine grain size. And a proper anneal leads to a fine distribution of carbides, which also helps to maintain a fine grain size during your final austenitize and quench. Another thing to keep in mind is that cycling by heating to austenite and air cooling will also spheroidize steel. There are micrographs of the same 1060 steel with different numbers of cycles where eventually you have annealed steel similar to a DET anneal. So if your goal is to have a perlite structure for a final forage heat treatment, too much cycling will affect the heat treatment response. Leaving the steel in the normalized condition isn't necessarily the end of the world as one of the highest toughness steels I've ever tested was 5160, which was normalized only before the final austenitize and quench. But to see if this affects anything in terms of heat treatment response, I tried doing a grain refining cycle by heating non-magnetic and air cooling with the 52100 that I had normalized. Then I heated it to non-magnetic and quenched in Parks 50 as with the other hardness experiments. This resulted in somewhat lower hardness in the normalized condition. I looked at the microstructure to see why and discovered that the grain refining cycle itself was enough to begin to spheroidize the carbide, so it was sort of in between the DET anneal and the normalized steel. The 1060 in the study shown before required several cycles to spheroidize, though higher carbon steels will spheroidize with cycling more readily because of the DET mechanism when carbides are still present after heating to non-magnetic.
To further explore the potential of grain refining cycles versus simply annealing, I measured the toughness of 1084. In every comparison, I austenitized at 1475 and quenched in parts 50 and tempered at 400 degrees for the final heat treatment. For one set, I used the steel as received from the manufacturer. In another set, I overheated the steel at 2100 for an hour, then did a DET anneal. No normalizing, no grain refining cycles. In another set, I overheated the steel at 2100 for an hour, normalized, then did grain refining from 1450 twice. Then with both of those different conditions, I austenitized at 1475, quenched in parts 50, and tempered at 400 degrees. The steel heat treated from the manufacturer condition was a point softer than either of the conditions that I annealed. However, the toughness was no better in the steel that I annealed. In fact, it was slightly worse because the steel was higher in hardness. The steel that I did normalizing and grain refining steps on had properties that were no different than the steel that had no such cycles. This does not mean I recommend skipping normalizing, as that is important after forging the steel. Normalizing is largely done for dissolving all of the structures that are created during forging, and these samples were only overheated with no forging. However, I think this experiment shows that extra grain refining cycles do not necessarily improve anything. Should you cycle material for stock removal? That is a difficult question given the discussion that we have had thus far. Most knife makers believe that they should normalize steel from the manufacturer to achieve a finer grain size. However, the experiments we have performed shown that it is changes in carbide structure that will have the greatest effect on final properties. If you are forging some knives and doing stock removal on others, I would probably recommend normalizing and annealing all of the steel for stock removal so that the starting structure is the same and the resulting hardness and toughness are the same between the different knives. If you are doing stock removal only, the decision is a bit tougher as a simple steel like 1084 will probably show little benefit. If working with something like 5200 or Crew Forge V, we did show some advantages from normalizing and annealing the steel for a finer structure, such as with the rapid DET discussed in this video. Should you normalize stainless? Uh, if you're forging stainless steels, they should not be normalized. You cannot dissolve the carbides because they are stable up to melting temperature. And air cooling will harden the steel rather than forming perlite. So neither of the goals of normalizing are really achieved. Instead, just anneal the steel after forging. I have a recommended temper anneal for stainless and high alloy tool steels in my book, Knife Engineering. For stock removal, you should use the steel as is from the manufacturer. After forging your steel, you normalize by heating the steel to the recommended normalizing temperature for 10 to 15 minutes and then air cooling. When the steel is magnetic again, the perlite transformation is complete and you can move on to the next step. Anneal the steel by heating to the recommended annealing temperature for 15 to 30 minutes and cooling at 600 degrees per hour. The steel is then ready for austenitizing, quenching, and tempering. If you're normalizing with a forge without temperature control, there isn't an easy way to achieve a specific normalizing process. I would recommend using a cheap laser thermometer, but mine always seems to be off by 200 degrees no matter what I set the emissivity to. This laser thermometer says I'm dying of hypothermia. Fortunately, normalization doesn't have to be at a super specific temperature. There's a range about 100 degrees that will be fine. If your final austenitizing quench will also be done in the forge, then this normalized condition is a good place to heat treat from because of how easy it is to austenitize the steel, even with steel like 52100 that has some alloy. If you'll be doing your final austenitize in a furnace, then annealing is done by heating to nod magnetic and no higher, and then slow cooling in a media like vermiculite. Next, I'm going to be putting these experiments to use in trying a forge heat treatment for the first time. I've always avoided it because I am in favor of controlled processes with repeatable results. And in a couple instances, I have tested steel heat treated in a forge by knife makers that wanted to show it can be done well, and the results were not good. However, by using normalized steel and heating no higher than non-magnetic, I think we can remove some of the guesswork. I've got seven different steels ready to test, so wish me luck for the next video. Okay, so I hope after this video you have a better idea of what we're trying to accomplish during our cycling or normalizing and annealing after our forging, but before our final heat treatment with austenitizing and quenching. Uh, I think you have a better understanding also of what we can and cannot accomplish during that thermal cycling. So some knife makers put a little bit too much emphasis on normalizing and annealing and cycling, uh, really thinking that they're going to get ultimate performance by doing this. Uh, but the most important step remains austenitizing, because uh, if you over austenitize, you're going to get too much carbon in solution or grain growth and you'll really drop your toughness. But if we set up the steel correctly with a good normalize and anneal, you'll get very good properties, assuming that your austenitize, quench, and temper are good. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, with, with grain refining, 
you know, there's only so much you can accomplish there. If you have a good anneal, you're going to have a fine grain size if you austenitize correctly. And spending a bunch of time on the grain refining aspect of it, I think misses the mark some on what we're trying to accomplish. So when we're trying to normalize an anneal, you've got to follow some, some good solid recommendations and you'll come up with a good final product. So thanks for watching. Thanks to my patrons for supporting me to do this kind of research. I wouldn't be able to do it without their support. Uh, please come join us on Patreon if you, if you want to support this kind of work and to learn more about knife steel in the future. Uh, buy my book, Knife Engineering. It's a good resource for how to anneal and how to normalize.